join together uh, to worship our Lord on another beautiful morning that he has uh, given us. Turn with me please to Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60. verses from Isaiah 60, 19 through to 22. And 22 is the verse that I want to focus on to get our minds ready for what the Lord will share through his word this morning. Isaiah 60, 19 through to 22. God's word reads, The sun shall be no more your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light. But the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. Your people shall all be righteous. They shall possess the land forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I might be glorified. This is the verse that I want us to think about. The least one shall become a clan, and the smallest one a mighty nation. I am the Lord. In its time, I will hasten it. Amen. And we know that God blesses the public reading of his word. Let's pray together. Father, as Peter prayed, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we come before the one when we pray at any time during the day, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, we can come to the one who is filled with mercy. We come to the one who is filled with grace and we come to the one who is so patient with us that remains faithful even though, Lord, we are wayward at times. Lord, we come to the one who's filled with so much love that you gave us your son. Lord Jesus, you willingly came to us. You willingly died for us. You rose for us. You're in heaven right now interceding for us and you will come back for us, those of us that are yours. Mm -hmm. It is to you that we come to. It is to you that we pray to and tell just our hearts to, our sadnesses, our annoyances, our praise, our asking, the one who never turns his ear away from his own. And yet, Lord, we do come to you as fallen creatures, but we're fallen creatures saved by your grace. And we, ha we are weak. We have our own particular weaknesses, Lord. We have our own particular sins, Lord, that we struggle with, each and every one of us. And it is a struggle and sometimes we think, why am I not moving on? Why can I not get over this? Everyone else seems to be doing well. Why am I not? Lord, help us to persevere. You know our hearts. You know our struggles. Help us to endure through every day. And Lord, we must thank you. We must thank you for the cross. In our endurances, in our perseverances, in our struggles, we must look through it all to the cross and see what you have done for us. You have provided the way. You are the truth and you are the light into our lives. Lord, we each have a message within us that we need to tell others about. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the blessings that it has given us. Lord, as Christians, as true Christians, as your true children, we are richer richer Lord beyond beyond our imaginations Lord heaven wait and it is so glorious we just need to stop that because we don't have words that can describe how wonderful it's going to be but we look we look forward in anticipation for your coming Lord today we pray for each other we are all pilgrims walking through this world, Lord. We're all carrying our own burdens. Help us to encourage and lift up one another. That's what true community is, as we're going to learn about later, Lord. Lord, we ask now that you overrule 
in the school's reopening. May it be sensible, Lord. May it be stress-free for parents alike, Lord. Keep the teachers safe. Lord, in saying and in thinking about that, Lord, we do pray for a vaccine. We ask you to give the intelligence to those people that are working on it right now at the right time. Lord, you are working already through all of this. You're in those labs, you're in those petri dishes, you're in all those things, Lord. You're working away. You're sovereign. And Lord, though we can look at our own um, lives right now, and yes, there are changes that have had to be made, Lord, hopefully for the better. But we do look out to Lebanon and think of those people in Beirut, Lord, who on top of what we're going through, they're suffering this calamity. So, Lord, we ask that the Christians, and I know there are those there, Lord, they may not be seen, but they are there, have an influence because they have a message as we're going to as well learn about later, Lord. And they will speak to people and people will come to a saving faith through them, even in this devastation. Lord, we lay before you all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Folks, as regards to announcements, as far as I am aware, there is no Zoom meeting tonight. Um, the midweek is at 8pm as usual, and most likely a WhatsApp will go around regarding how that um, operates. Uh, Andy, your pastor, still on holiday, so if you need anything, I think it's still Victor and Gary uh, to make contact with. And next week, you're blessed with Alistair, who's coming to share God's word with you. So now it's time for the, the children's talk, and as I was uh, sharing last week about Hudson Taylor, this week I want to share a story about uh, Amy Carmichael, and I had the privilege, I think of my mind, um, recollects to visit one of her works in India, uh, and what a work she did um, out there. So we're going to just learn the next few minutes about a brief story about Amy Carmichael, and how the Lord used her to do mighty kingdom work. Amy Carmichael lived in a big house by the ocean with her father and her mother and her two brothers Norman, her older brother Norman and her little brother Ernest. Amy and her brothers would often get into mischief together. Amy liked to think of new and exciting games to play. But what Amy really longed for, what her heart desired, was adventure. One day Amy wanted to sail out to sea. It would be so exciting, she thought. Come on, she yelled to her brothers. Let's go find a rowing boat. And when they arrived at the beach and walked along the beach, there was a rowing boat. It didn't take long before when they went out, out way out into the sea, that all of a sudden it got stormy. What started out as a real adventure suddenly it was becoming a bit dangerous. So they enjoyed it at first, it was exciting, but then they got tired and they wanted to go back into shore, but the sea was bringing them further out and the shore was getting all the smaller, and they kept sailing further and further and further out. What were they going to do? So Amy had this idea, let's sing. Let's sing as loud as we can. Somebody might hear us. And sure enough, a sailor from the shore heard them, and he went out and he rescued them. Amy's mother gave them a real telling off when they got home. Sailing out to sea is very dangerous, she exclaimed. Amy decided not to play that game anymore. Another day, Amy and her brothers climbed out onto the roof because they said, we can look away out to sea. It's going to be exciting, she thought. But they got stuck. When Amy's father saw them, when he came home, he looked up in the fright of his life and he went and he rescued them. And guess what? He gave them a real scolding, saying, that's dangerous. Amy decided not to play that game anymore. Another day, Amy, Amy was told that eating plum stones is not good for you. I wonder if they're telling me the truth. If you eat a load of plums, is it really not good for you? So Amy sat down, got a basket of 12 plums, and gorged them all down all at once. She got sick. Her parents told her that eating plum stones was highly dangerous. And what you did was very silly. Guess what? 
Amy decided not to play that game anymore. One morning Amy woke up and she lifted up her mirror and she saw her long brown hair and her soft brown eyes and a sad face. Brown eyes are boring, she thought. She went downstairs and watched her mother make breakfast and she asked, why did God give me brown eyes and not blue eyes? I'd look pretty if I had blue eyes, wouldn't I? What a strange thing to say, laughed her mother. I think your eyes are beautiful, Amy. Afterwards, when her mother was cleaning up the dishes, Amy asked, God answers prayers, doesn't he? Yes, Amy, he does, replied her mother. He will answer my prayers, won't he? Of course he will, her mother smiled. He will answer my prayers tonight. Amy jumped up for joy and she ran to the garden. And Amy's mother looked puzzled. Why on earth does she not want brown eyes? Why does she want blue eyes? <clears throat> that night Amy prayed to God, God, please give me blue eyes. The next morning she woke up. Oh, I still have brown eyes. Why hasn't God answered my prayers? Amy's mother gave her a hug. She said, God does answer prayers. Sometimes they're yes, sometimes they're no, sometimes he makes you wait. But why? Why? Puzzled Amy. I don't know, Amy, her mother replied. Maybe one day he will answer your prayer. Sometime later, Amy went off on an adventure to India. She wanted to tell the people about how much Jesus loved them. Very few people knew about the one true God. Some even sold their babies to temple priests, and the priests didn't look after these children very well. So Amy tried to rescue as many as she could. Often in the middle of the night, she went off now for her adventures to steal away these babies and to bring them to live with her. One night, Amy crept into a temple and was listening. She was listening for baby's cries and she heard a baby cry and quickly Amy followed the noise and grabbed the baby. And the baby looked up, just looked into her nice brown eyes and smiled and stopped crying. I now know why God gave me brown eyes, Amy thought as she walked quietly out of the temple. Brown eyes are not scary to Indian babies. Blue eyes would have been too strange and that baby would have roared all the more. When God said no, he gave me just the right answer that I needed. There you go, there's Amy Carmichael and another missionary story for you. But let's now turn to uh, God's word and we want to turn to Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Hopefully getting uh, uh, some of these stories will encourage you to go out and, or even though you can't go out that much now, can you go online to Amazon and find out uh, what other stories you can get about missionaries. Um, they're, they're a joy to read and a real blessing to read about biographies of other people. Matthew 13. And today we're going to take a look at the parable of the mustard seed and the leaven. So just have your Bibles open up at Matthew 13 and uh, we're going to read in a moment 31 through to 33. But before we do, I want to uh, begin by asking each of us a few questions. What do you think when you look around other churches and they appear to be growing compared to yours? What do you think when you look at other Christians and they appear to be making more spiritual progress than you seem to be? And as I was thinking about these things, when you look out and around, it's easy to become discouraged. You can be easily distracted by the size and the speed of how other ministries or people are getting on in their world. Well, Jesus has a message for each of us this morning, and it's this. Don't be. 
Don't be discouraged or distracted by the size of things and the speed at which things seem to be happening. Jesus is telling us this morning that he assures us, he assures each of us here, that if we are being faithful, there is kingdom work being done, either in your church here or a particular ministry, or in your own personal holiness. It is being done. So let's turn now to look at these two uh, parables that he said together. They're par parables, and it begins in 31 saying, He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches and in the same breath he told them another parable and said the kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened you see up to this point here in Matthew 13 Jesus has been sharing with his disciples that there will be growth my message your work will spread but as the disciples looked on, what Jesus was telling them wasn't equating to what they actually saw. So let's for a moment imagine that each of us are Matthew. We've just travelled back 2,000 years. And you're walking down another street in another town. Another day has passed. And you see the crowds that are coming to listen to Jesus. Then as you walk out of that town, you still see only 12 people following Jesus. You're walking through the countryside to another town, and you come across another Roman battalion. Everywhere you look, you see the might of Rome and her influence everywhere. And you think to yourself, what I see here is Caesar seems to be in charge. Caesar seems to be the Lord and not Jesus. Even his own people have thrown him out of these villages. And the Pharisees are getting really annoyed with him. It's been a year and a half. And there's not much of this growth that he's been talking about happening here. Matthew, like the 11 other disciples, were slowly losing hope. You see, they feel dejected. They have left their businesses, they've left their homes, and they've very little money. Their expectations of what Jesus was telling them weren't being met. Their optimism that they had started out with was slowly waning into pessimism. They can't see the results of what Jesus was saying. And it's the same for us, isn't it? When we don't see results, we too can pray, can fall prey to hopelessness. See, Jesus' disciples at this stage were becoming restless and disillusioned and discouraged. And you know what? Jesus knew that. He knows our hearts. And so Jesus wants to encourage them. You see, encouragement, as you know, and Jesus knows, knew, is needed for our everyday walk. Our Lord knows that we are all prone to discouragement. He knows too that the devil loves reminding you of your lack of progress. You're not making progress, are you? You've been a Christian for years. Not much progress happening there, both in our own walks and in our church. He loves nothing more than a beaten, discouraged, Christian. Not much use. You see, it's an emotion discouragement that we all experience, isn't it? And so we must, as a small community in God's vineyard, look out for each other and encourage each other because encouragement is the very core of what the true community of Christ really is. It helps us through the rough times and the tough times, doesn't it? And that's why the Bible tells us to encourage and build up one another so important. Why? Because it can give us the will to carry on through those hard times. 
And so this pair of parables that our Lord is teaching, it encouraged the disciples and encourages us to look towards seeing the bigger picture of his work. You see, these men, as I said, had given up much time and invested a uh, time away from homes and invested much time with Jesus. And it appeared that nothing much was happening. Jesus' disciples, like all of us, were suffering from something known as instant gratification. We want results now. Not waiting, I want them now. But Jesus is about to teach us that kingdom building takes time. Time. The effects that you're expecting may not be visible. You may not see them. But if the Holy Spirit is at work truly, then progress is being made both in your own life, ministries, and your church. Jesus is about to tell us that time and effort are needed to build something of quality. Jesus is telling each of us this morning, refuse to be discouraged. Refuse it. Jerome was an early church father and he put it really well. He said, God has us in a world that is an arena of both struggle and and endurance. Struggle and endurance. If there's a struggle you need to endure, you have to endure through a struggle. And despite the smallness and the slowness of our efforts, Jesus is saying, persevere. And although you may not see this progress that you want to see right away, I'm telling you right now, it will come. Why? Because I have promised you it will. Let's stand in the promises of our Lord. And this is why the Bible, when you read it, it is filled with so many words like endure, persevere, remain steadfast, don't be weary. You see, it was the disciples, now get this, perception of the smallness and the obscurity and the seeming lack of progress in Jesus' ministry that prompted Jesus to teach them that the gospel message will spread and its influence will be felt by the world regardless of what you see right now. Each of us can suffer from this perception as well, can't we? Why is our church not growing the way I would love it to grow? Why are more people not coming to the prayer meeting? Why is the youth group still got 10 or 20 people? Why is there not more people? Down the road, they're getting hordes of them. But Jesus says, have faith. Faith is putting your trust in what you can't necessarily see. But trusting in his promises. And we all need to be reminded of that, I believe, from time to time. So let's see now in a bit more detail what our Lord is drawing out. That what does he want us to learn from this parable? Verse 31. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. So what is this kingdom of heaven? Sorry, what is this kingdom of heaven that our Lord is talking about here? This morning across this world many people have woken up and are members of the kingdom of God. Through faith and repentance they have put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and they're under his lordship. He is their lord. But there's many people this morning have woken up as well and they are not members of his kingdom. And whether they acknowledge it or not, they are members of a different kingdom. One that's ruled by Satan. So the kingdom of God that our Lord is talking about here, and the thread of it runs through Matthew, it's a people. The kingdom of God is a people. It's a people that have hope and assurance and a message within them. 
It's not fixed by borders. The kingdom of God that our Lord is talking about here is found in hearts of people that have been influenced by the gospel message and changed. If you're a Christian, then the kingdom of God is within you. And it goes wherever you go. The kingdom of God is Christ living within each of us. So Jesus uses these illustrations here of the mustard seed and the leaven to show us that the greatness of the outcomes compared to the smallness of beginnings. Don't look to size. But why use a mustard seed? Why is our Lord talking about a mustard seed here? After all, as the critics of the Bible, and there's no shortage of them, they say that the mustard seed is not the smallest seed around. Poppy seeds are smaller. Listen, our Lord does not want to have a botanical discussion here. All right? He's not interested in the bot botanics here. Or botany. Our Lord, remember, the creator of all things, he knows fine well that the mustard seed that he created isn't the smallest seed around. He doesn't need these scientists to tell him that. What our Lord is doing here using this image of a mustard seed, he's using a Jewish proverb. He's using a, a proverb that highlights the smallness of something. And Jesus was speaking, remember, into a first century agricultural uh, setting. So in fact, for those farmers that would have been listening into here, into him, they would have known the mustard seed is smallest seed that I use because I'm usually throwing grain out, which is much bigger. Our Lord's using hyperbole, hyper, hyperbole here, hyperbole. He's exaggerating something. He knows rightly, and so do these people listening in. The mustard seed doesn't grow into a tree. It normally grows to about seven or eight feet high. So what he's doing, he's getting their attention and they're saying to themselves, there's something different about this mustard seed here. There's something different about his kingdom compared to all other kingdoms that we have heard of. You see, what Jesus was saying here is this, that once this seed was sown, it would grow far more than would be expected of it. And it would be able to give haven to birds, many birds. Birds in Jerusalem, Damascus, Macedonia, birds, people, Christians, all over the world. Jesus is teaching us here, don't despise the day of small beginnings. He is telling us that the principle of small beginnings is the way of the world. Think about it. McDonald's. McDonald's started with two men in a kitchen in a wee town. Look at it now, it's a global giant. The Ulster Revival started with five people praying. A 15 year old boy one evening walked into a service with no less than 12 people in it and heard the same verse repeated over and over again. That small boy became George Hatton Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers. Bea Vista is a prison in Medellin in Colombia which I visited. It was built for 1,200 inmates and had about 3,000 in it. And for years, it experienced 20 and 30 murders a week. It housed some of the most serious serial killers around. I talked to a guy who openly said I killed over 90 people for a local cartel guy. A lady, a 40-year-old lady about 20 years ago, quietly, decided to bring the gospel message into Bea Vista. Unseen, she just walked in and started this low-level ministry. A month after she had started, the prison authorities started taking a look at the number of murders, and they saw that. Why has that stopped? And when they investigated, about a month after Janine came in with the gospel message, this single lady Unseen, under the radar, the number of murders stopped. The prison authority said, what do you need? And when I visited there, there was a seminary started up in this prison. 
and men who were once serial killers were influenced by the gospel message and they are pastors now within the prison. And those prisoners, those men that are saved because of the gospel message came in under the radar by a single lady, unseen, unheard, not a show. They moved from prison to prison and do you know what? The kingdom of God is within them and do you know what? They spread the gospel wherever they go. These, and you can know many, many stories as well, illustrate that would begin small, almost insignificant and unseen, can and does grow into something mighty, something of great influence. Just like this small mustard seed, just like leaven, working in dough. And this is what exactly what Jesus is teaching us here in these parables. But I think you can agree with me now that there's no greater example of something that had such a, such a pitiable beginning that has become huge, that, that has become huge, that has and continued to will be to have such a great influence in the world than Christianity itself. There's no greater example. Christianity, when you trace it back and look at its beginnings, it didn't look promising, did it? It looked pathetic. Think about it. In a stable, in an obscure little town that was hated called Bethlehem, in the Judean hills hid away, and a tiny defenseless baby boy was born. And that little family had to escape to Egypt because a cruel king was about to kill all infant boys under the age of two. At the age of 12, we read a tiny little bit that he went to Jerusalem. Then years of silence. Nothing. All we know is he was a carpenter in an ordinary house down an ordinary street in an ordinary little town. And not until he was 30 years old did his ministry begin. And even after a year and a half, he had only 12 people following him. And after his death and resurrection and ascension, there was only around 500 very humble beginnings was Christianity. But despite the apparent smallness and obscurity and the rejections and the setbacks that Christianity has experienced, it continues to grow. What began in an animal shed is now throughout the whole of the earth. That once despised, discouraged little band of first century believers grew. Fast forward 2,000 years to today. And this tiny little mustard seed that Jesus planted in Galilee has grown into the biggest and longest living kingdom that has and ever will be. Think about it. The once mighty Assyrian Empire gone. Babylon, Rome, gone. The Ottoman Empire, the Napoleonic Empire, the Mongolian Empire, the British Empire, gone. When you go into a shop and you get a book on history, it's always the rise and fall of not Christianity. It overcame the Dark Ages. It overcame the Reformation when tens of thousands of Baptists, never mind all the rest, were murdered. Modernism has attacked it and said the word of God. It's not the word of God. It survived that. Postmodernism, it has said Christianity, that's just an opinion you have. But Christianity continues to grow. We're about to enter what's known as a post Christian era, in which all the guys and women that are researching this are saying God's going to be replaced by man as the creator, the lawgiver and the saviour of the world. But do you know what? It'll be that as well. Christianity has spread to all corners of the earth from that tiny little manger. It is branches throughout Africa, Europe, India, Asia, Latin America, everywhere. And although some of its branches have been diseased by false doctrines and errors, the tree of Christianity will continue to grow and march on and spread through the whole of this earth. Today, 
Some of those people that I said woke up that belonged to a different kingdom will become members of Christ's kingdom. Why? Why will they go to bed tonight? Rejuvenated, regenerated, a new person because they have come in contact with the gospel. <clears throat> Christianity has beat them all and the kingdom of God will continue to march on. So take heart, folks. You're on the winning side. Today, the Christian faith is more widespread than any other religion, faith, or ideology, despite what you might perceive. Never be discouraged because something seems small, obscure, or slow. The kingdom of God began small, didn't it? And slow to make progress. So again, consciously refuse to be discouraged because you don't see things growing the way you want to do or things moving as fast as you want to see. If not, we each can become part of the worldly mindset. Big is beautiful. He's got a big car, you know. She's got a big position. They have built a big house. Big, big, big. Everything's about big. Big church building, big congregation. Jesus is saying, don't concern yourself with the size of something. It's quality that matters. Do you know this morning there's tens of thousands of people in big churches been fed big lies? Persevere, endure, don't give up, don't lose hope, don't look down the road or across the water. Do you know F.B. Meyer, who's blessed millions in his books, looked across a couple of streets and saw the tabernacle with Charles Adam Spurgeon. He looked over there and he saw Campbell Morgan, Morgan in Westminster and they were growing his little flock. He could have easily lost hope going, do you know what he did? He prayed for their work to be blessed because he knew he was part of something bigger. The kingdom of God is a collective community. God's people are working together, are they not? All over the world. Some in areas where it seems to be growing faster than others. But they're all working together to something that is much bigger to themselves and their local congregations. One commentator rightly said this, Obsession with size is obscene. Respect the infinitude of the little. God's work begins small. But the influence can be mighty. Small beginnings do influence. But they take time. And just like the influence here of our second little parable that's joined on. Look at verse 33. Just like the influence of a little leaven has on a piece of dough. You see here the leaven is talking about the influence of the gospel. The kingdom of heaven about its progress and its influence through something, not only in a person, but through the whole world. Look what it says. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Don't get, don't get distracted by this woman. Don't get distracted about the measures. So many people have gone down those avenues and ended up in nonsense. Our focus here is on the leaven. You know, some have taught that the leaven here represents corruption and wickedness growing on the earth and even in the church because they say Jesus, when he used leaven, talked about the wickedness of the Pharisees. But we need to be very careful when we're reading a passage to get the context. We need to be very careful about our biblical interpretation because if we go down that line, Satan, he's known as a roaring lion. Does that mean that in the Bible every land that you come across is wicked and evil and satanic? Absolutely not. Stuff and nonsense. Why? Who's called the Lion of Judah? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Context is so important. And what Jesus is teaching here through the leaven is that there is spiritual work being done where he is. And it may not be seen by the human eye, but where he is is being done. Just because you can't see something happening doesn't mean it's not happening. Regardless of wherever the people of God are, 
like those prisoners that I was talking about earlier. Their work will go on quietly and powerfully, often unseen. God's kingdom has branches that are slowly extending into the most hostile environments on the face of this earth. You may not see it, hear whispers about it, but in communist China and in North Korea and in the Middle East, the gospel is influencing people in secret, but it's changing their lives. People have been watching online services for the past three or four months that would never have come into that church. Let me assure you, don't despair. I hear people say, I'm sick of them. Shame on them. That's the gospel message coming out. That is someone opening up the word of God and sharing it online. God is using that. God's changing lives through those things. God is at work. He's always at work where his word is. The kingdom of God's like that. And at times we look to our own walks, don't we? We look at our ministries and it appears that they're not developing or we're not developing the way we think we should be. Don't be discouraged. You know, don't be looking at that question, the question, why is there not more people coming? Why is there only one new person there? Why is there only one new person in that youth group? Do you know what? That one new person could be the person that hears something and goes to wherever the word is not. That one person that has just come along could hear a, a message or even in a single tiny little conversation and they go to the unreached. The work of the the work and growth of the gospel is often unseen, isn't it? Who would have thought that looking at one man on a cross, who would have thought that what they were seeing there would bring salvation to so many? This is how the gospel works. It spreads little by little, often unseen. The kingdom of God grows behind closed doors when a person prays secretly on their knees. The kingdom of God starts to grow in the heart of a man or a woman who has heard a gospel message in their, when they were a boy or a girl. It takes time. The kingdom of God grows in a home and a husband takes precedence and shares the word of God each day with his family. And as I mentioned earlier, the kingdom of God grows behind prison bars. And men and women take that gospel message and the kingdom of God is growing. Kingdom work is, it's not always obvious. It's not, it's a, a lot of the time it's invisible. Just like that little yeast in that loaf, working away, working away, slowly and surely. Hudson Taylor that I talked about last week, sat around listening to his father's stories about China and the lost people. About 10 years later, he was sitting in his father's office and he read a tract. And what his father said 10 years ago struck with him. He was saved and he went to China and looked at the effects. Mm -hmm. Tiny conversations in a little family, a single pamphlet. China has been reached. And so Jesus is telling us in these two parables, don't lose hope, don't despair. Though it may seem that you or what you're involved in appears to be small and weak and vulnerable and silent in society, it's still growing and it will keep on growing. You see, the transforming influence of the gospel will not end until Christ returns and he is coming to finalize and bring to completion his kingdom and he'll make all things new. And just like you cannot separate a piece of leaven, just like you can't separate yeast from dough, the gospel can't be stopped. It can't. Gospel influence will permeate through every quarter of the world, just like this leaven here permeates through that whole dough. And you know it works in us, doesn't it? We're all different. How we come to the Lord and our walks are all different. Jesus is never satisfied with only a part of a person. He wants the whole person. Remember that. He wants your whole life. 
The spirit influences your conscience. And next, your understanding. And finally, your will. Until the whole person is changed. You know what? Becoming who Jesus wants you to become takes a lifetime. It takes time. And Jesus is telling us that the spiritual influence has to crawl before it walks. And he's reminding us that there is more going on than you can imagine. I'm at work. Where my word is, I'm at work. Where my people are, I'm at work. Don't be concerned about how fast things are moving. Like leaven and dough, it works at different speeds. So does the Spirit of God. Be more concerned with the direction that your ministry or your life is moving. What I have started, I will finish. So how can we apply this to finish with? How can we apply the principles of these two parables? Do you know what gives us the correct perspective of our own spiritual growth? Gives us the right perspective of the progress of our ministries and our churches? Because we, like these disciples that I've read of here, mm -hmm. uh, we can become very discouraged when we do not see the progress we want to see. And it's good to have that yearning, but Jesus says it takes time. We are growing well for a time, maybe, in your Christian walk. Each of us are growing well, we're making steady progress. We're doing well, and then stagnation. Why have I stopped growing? But listen, God is still at work in you. Churches and ministries start off with these big expectations. You have your meetings and you're going to do this and that and you plan it all out. You start off with optimism. But when these expectations that you set out aren't bad, oh, what's the point? Ministries may be small and struggling and you wonder, is, uh, is what I'm doing having any impact at all? But God is still at work where his faithful servants are. Whenever you get discouraged, you need to remember what our Lord is teaching here. So even if you don't see the growth you want to see, where the gospel is, where the Holy Spirit is, he's at work bringing people to faith, strengthening faith and transforming the world as it advances. Kingdom work is about quality, not size and speed. So listen carefully. Drink this in. Stay faithful. Walk with endurance. Encourage each other as you go along. And above all, believe in the promises and the word of God that we read about here this morning. Work out your own spiritual growth. Work out your own salvation. And tend the little corner of God's vineyard that he has put you in. Leave the rest to God. Amen. Amen. Father, in each of our own lives, whatever ministries we're a part of, help us to endure. Help us to stay faithful. Help us not to be concerned about what's going on somewhere else, Lord, and comparing ourselves. Help us to stay faithful to you. Stay close to you and have the faith of William Carey, Lord, that father of modern day missions. Carey, Lord, was seven years before he seen a single convert and after 40 years, Lord, the fruits of his labours were so minimal. But Lord, he endured, he stayed faithful and he kept his eye on the work that you had given him. And you know what he said? The future is as bright as the promises of God. Expect great things from God. Do great things for Him. Father, give us the faith. Amen. Give us the endurance. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen.